Good afternoon. I greet you in Jesus' name. It's a pleasure to be here, an opportunity. I'm thankful for the opportunity. And um, the topic that has been assigned to me is under the umbrella of community development and helping without hurting. So I would like to look into this topic in four different areas. Uh, first one being definitions and maybe looking at a kind of a global snapshot. What What is what does um, the what do the the uh, analysts say about about community development and and microfinance perhaps? Then I'm going to look at two stories, um, just to differentiate different methods. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about the Salt Program, its goals, vision, and purpose, and then conclude on this uh, principles of community development that may complement church planting. Today is uh, a church day, and you have a number of folks here from different uh, sending churches for all nations teams. So is there a bridge? Are there principles surrounding community development that would would apply or set the stage or help in, in the local church. So let's start with definitions. Um, savings groups are a powerful force in the developing world. According to the SEEP network, there's about 15 million people or beneficiaries in savings groups today in about 73 countries across Latin America, Afri Africa, the Middle East, and, and Asia. Thousands of organizations are doing this, um, and they're commonly known in the industry as MFIs, or microfinance institutions, is a common uh, uh, aspect as they're identified. And that is a broad, broad segment there. Um, I would say as I study different parts of the world that do microfinance, they have a couple of primary focuses, uh, financial literacy being one of them, or inclusion in the formal banking system. Most of us from the West or developed countries don't really think about banks in the way that many people do in developing countries. And another major focus is women's empowerment. Now, I was talking to a brother, one of the North brothers, earlier today, and from a biblical worldview, we're certainly not anti-women. We're very pro-women. Uh, I think where uh, our focus would separate from the mainstream development focus out there would be why we're interested in in women being who God created them to be in the godly home and in marriages and so forth. So again, we're talking about the global snapshot. So who is doing this today? NGOs or non-government organizations, Islamic development, Catholic charities is huge, Protestant evangelical development organizations, banks, and many more. And frankly, we have a lot to learn from them. Uh, I think Brother Ken said it well this morning. He said we should use material from other organizations critically. And I think that is very true in, in all aspects of what, what are they doing well? What can we learn? And how does God's word align with that or not? Um, only 6% of microfinance beneficiaries, again, 15 million people, ser are served by professing Christian organizations. So there are many, many organizations doing microfinance and very few of them would be under the Christian banner. And understand the Christian banner is very, very broad from Catholic and, and many others. Um, primary focus is financial literacy, access to the formal banking system. In some cases, Women empowerment, such as illiteracy, child marriage, domestic violence, and more. Um, in the Islamic world, women are generally devalued. Uh, they're not the same as a man. Uh, in fact, in Sharia law, it would say a woman's testimony is worth one-third of that of a man. And if they're following Sharia law, uh, practically, 
uh, a woman can't testify in a court case in a murder situation. So there are many difficult things in the world for sure. Genesis 3 is real, as I like to say. I have a brief video that seems to capture, and again, we're thinking about the broader umbrella of um, savings groups or microfinance that seems to capture the objectives of most savings groups or what is sometimes called VSLA or Village Savings and Loan Associations. That's a very common term in the developing world. It all starts when someone in the developing world has the courage to follow a dream. A dream of starting a new business that breaks the cycle of poverty, creates new jobs, and generates lasting financial independence. For over half the world, that dream often seems out of reach. Getting a small business loan from traditional lenders can be expensive and inflexible. And if you live in poor rural neighborhoods, it may not be available at all. Fortunately, millions of people around the world are taking control of their own destiny by joining village savings groups, which act as informal community banks. Every week, members make small contributions to a central investment fund. When a member needs money to expand her small business, send her kids to school, or buy medicine, she requests a short-term loan from her group. Unlike outside bank loans, all interest payments are invested directly back into the group. So when a member's business grows, everyone benefits. It's an amazingly powerful model that's breaking the cycle of poverty for millions worldwide. While savings groups are changing the game, managing them isn't always easy. Each month, hundreds of transactions have to be calculated by hand. Cash deposits, which can grow large over time, are stored in simple lockboxes in the home of a trusted member. And worst of all, Members who work hard to build good credit history through smart investments are still completely invisible to formal banks when they're ready for larger loans. That's where DreamSave comes in. It's an amazing mobile app that makes it easy to manage savings groups without all the complexity and risk. Members decide how they want to run their group, and DreamSave does the rest managing records, calculating interest, and making it fun and easy to track personal goals. Members can access their personal financial data from any type of phone for full financial transparency. Records are also backed up securely to the cloud after each meeting through our highly optimized DreamSync technology. So even remote villages with limited internet access can rest easy knowing their records are no longer at risk of theft, damage, or loss. When groups are ready to connect to formal financial services, DreamSave makes it easy to take the next step. Cash deposits can start earning interest in secure savings accounts, and people who've been excluded for generations can access fair and convenient financial services for the first time ever. Some say it's crazy to believe people in developing countries can use mobile technology to change the world. And maybe that's okay, because sometimes the world needs dreamers crazy enough to believe that innovation, passion, and self-reliance really can triumph over poverty. So you can see one of their primary goals is connecting the formal people to the formal banking system. And domestically, we view banks as very open and available, and we have many choices. But that's simply not the case for most of the world's population. Uh, I've seen people stand in line for hours, come early morning, only be told no, and then they do it again tomorrow and the next day. In other words, using technology, they're able to record their village savings transaction to the formal banking, and eventually they can get access to formal banking. So here is what the mainstream organizations are not doing. They're not taking the tremendous opportunity of people coming together weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, and with frequent meetings to teach them about Jesus Christ. In some cases, there may be some small business teaching, but not so much. Mostly about financial literacy and access to the formal banking system. 
And this is a major differentiator between mainstream savings groups and the purpose of the SALT program. In fact, over the years, we've continued to receive requests for teaching content from professing Christian organizations. And we kept pondering, thinking about the millions of people that are gathering together on a regular basis. What an opportunity. So we created this new seed sowing effort, you might call it, under the Good Steward International banner. And now, when people ask for teaching content, why not provide it? So this thinking about these 15 million people in village savings groups that gather together every week or bi-weekly in groups of 20 or 30 people, perhaps we don't align with these professing Christian organizations around the world in terms of doctrine or how we live out the Bible. But the goal here is to simply give them the teaching content, including all the resources and mechanisms to start a savings group, and they're using it. So this is a new initiative, and we're starting with a professing Christian group in Western India. There's about 120 small rural churches with between 30 and 200 believers per church. 70% are women, and the churches have small women group committees, usually about five to 20 people. And they have various activities, such as scripture memory, study materials based on the Bible. Some do literacy classes. Some of these church committees are women reaching out to other women in India, of course, Hindu. But the teaching isn't really organized or very structured. So we're hoping savings group will draw other people into the groups. We're in conversations with a few groups from Indonesia as well and hope to start some marketing efforts to stateside mission organizations. Uh, there's development conference like ECHO, Hope International, and, and others that we hope to use this content. So again, I'm going to move on now. We've kind of looked at the big picture landscape just very, very briefly in terms of, of um, what how does mainstream, the, the, the mainstream world use community development, particularly from a microfinance perspective? And if you were here on Tuesday to listen to Billy North's topic, you know, by now you know, I think someone said it earlier, community development is a very, very wide uh, umbrella of things that can be done, whether it's appropriate technology, whether it's microfinance, et cetera. So I'd like to look at two stories uh, in terms of one, I have personal experience, and the other comes from, from a book. So I'd like to read a story from uh, Jonathan Martin from Giving Wisely, his book from Giving Wisely. Uh, Gary Miller quoted that in his Other Side of the Wall book, and there's just a brief story here. I'd like to, uh, to review that. So in his book, Giving Wisely, Jonathan Martin tells of a well-meaning church group that traveled to Mexico to help a small indigenous congregation. This little church was located in a shanty town just outside Mexico City and was extremely poor. All of them, including the pastor, lived in makeshift, makeshift plastic tents. The American congregation wanted to help, so they raised some funds, traveled to Mexico, and built a new church building for this impoverished congregation. They even built a nice little house for the pastor. After all, they reasoned, a man of God shouldn't have to live under a filthy scrap of plastic tarp. This group of charitable Americans worked hard, and after they finished the project, they packed up their tools, hugged the, Mer the Mexican believers they had come to love, and headed back north. For many of them, their lives would never be the same. They had seen a need, correctly realized they should share, and went to the rescue of this underprivileged church. Then they went home to show pictures of the project to their friends and talk about what a blessing it is to help those in need. But little did these Americans know that shortly after their vehicles were out of sight, the church members disassembled the very building the Americans had just constructed. Reusing the materials, they rebuilt the building in the way they really had wanted it at the location they had wanted in the first place. But even worse was the long-term spiritual effect on the church. Just one year later, this once thriving church was almost totally dysfunctional. How can this be? How could constructing a church building and a new home for the pastor destroy Christ's body in this particular area? Martin explains it in his book. First, it raised the pastor to a level higher than those he ministered to, creating an artificial inequity. 
Second, the building wasn't a product of the locals' vision, giving, and hard work. In other words, it had nothing to do with them at all, but everything to do with America. It left the locals wondering, whose church is this anyway? Martin went on to say, dissent broke out in the church because it looked like the pastor had sold out to the American ways and customs. There was suspicion he might even be receiving ongoing aid. Consequently, this once flourishing church was torn apart in the resulting turmoil. They were worse off than if help had never come. So was the help about Americans or was it about the people they were trying to minister to? There's no question the foreigners had good intentions. But perhaps they didn't take the time to learn from the indigenous people. So what could they have done differently? Perhaps this is something you can think about in your own work and ponder. I strongly believe, agree with Brother Ken that we have much to learn from history, from the early church and everything in between to today. I don't have all the answers, but we can learn. I'd like to go to Asia now in another story. It's a local church, country in Southeast Asia. This brother learned about Christ from an indigenous believer from his community. They decided where and when they will hold worship services. Worship services are in their homes and in small offices that are used for community development because there's many people there all the time. The natives, the, the community around them never knows when they're gathering to worship or gathering for an educational class. They usually sit on hard concrete floors in small circles for worship. This man's name, I'll call him Hamid. A few months ago, when my wife and I visited seven different Anabaptist missions scattered throughout Asia, I had the opportunity to sit with him and talk to him. And he started by sharing about his growing up years. Hafiza Madrasa is what he attended when he was young, and Hafiza Madrasa is a school that is no academics, it's religious only. And he talks about memorizing the Quran in the Arabic language. And he shared about regularly getting beaten by his teachers for things like using English words, reading, reading the newspaper, bringing a badminton racket to school, or not having the proper Islamic dress. In the country Hamid is from, these schools are very, very dark places with horrible abuse of young boys. Hamid told me his home life was very difficult with angry and aggressive parents. He said they, he also became angry and their home never had peace. As a young man, he desperately tried to find God. He faithfully went to the mosque for five daily prayers, but he said he never had peace. And he asked many times, is there a way to know if man has salvation? And as he became a more devout Muslim, he became involved in radical Islam. He was actually following his faith's tenets. Fast forward a few years. In 2016, Hamid abandoned the darkness of Islam and became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said earlier, he learned first about this truth from one of his own people. And for the past few years, he's worked as a facilitator in the SALT program, sharing his new faith with many others. And as I've walked with Hamid over the past few years, he's an inspiration to my own faith. I know I have many things to learn from him on how to share the gospel with my neighbors and my coworkers and the person at the grocery store or the market. And in fact, many times I've been overseas and have been inspired beyond question about seeing the Lord work in the lives of men and women to the point where I'd just be, I want to go home and tell someone about this. And about the time the wheels of the plane hit the runway as you come back home to the stateside, I get this sick feeling deep within. And when it's time to get on the plane the next time, I say, am I even qualified to get on this plane? When I, what about my neighbors? 
There's 30 neighbors that live up that street. Do I know them? Do I know? Do they know about Jesus? America is no longer many young people are growing up and they never heard the name of Jesus. Let's go back to Hamid's story. Today, he's 28 years old. He recently married this young Christian lady who is in her early 20s. She's also a Muslim background believer. Earlier this year, Hamid was ordained as a pastor to lead a small house church of 33 believers. He is joined in leading this church with a deacon that was ordained about a year earlier. The question is, will he remain faithful long term? Will he continue being open to discipleship and discovering the gospel? Only God knows. Why be faithful? Will you be faithful? I do know this. The missionaries walking with these saints have a tremendous burden for ongoing discipleship and discovering the word of God collectively. And that's a journey. It's not an event. And you know what? It's lifelong the Lord calls us home. So helping without hurting is the goal. What can we learn from these two stories? I would be interested in hearing from you about this as we continue talking. I'd like to move on, talk a little bit about the SALT goals, vision, and principles. How does SALT do community development? And how is it different than the thousands of organizations we briefly reviewed at the outstart? Or that the biblical principle of community development, we actually do help in lieu of harming. You know, sometimes in my work, I work with many missionary organizations, and I hear this refrain frequently. We'd like to have a missionary work so our young people can go and serve. And I think that's honorable and noble. But my question for you is, is it about the Americans, or is it about where we're going? And that is a big question. If you, filter, if you look through the lens who is this about? That changes a lot of things. SALT is an acronym, shared, accountability, lending, and teaching. What's its purpose? Share the gospel with unbelievers, happening today in Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, animus settings. So again, people that don't know about the Lord Jesus. Another goal is frequent teaching meetings to help professing Christians learn what it means to live out Jesus' teaching in daily living. On that point, we have a small salt program in the country of South Sudan. South Sudan is a very, very sad place. Tremendous needs. And when we first started researching in South Sudan, we asked them, what do you need? And in most developing countries of the world, they'll say, They'll have an object, something. Give it and life will be better. These people ask for teaching. I don't have time to talk about the tremendous needs in that place. But they started the SALT program. They started coming together, having regular teaching. And here recently, one of our staff members was back in the country. They had a savings group meeting. They had teaching. And this, this South Sudanese woman came up to our staff member and she said, do you know, it says in the Bible, it's wrong for a man to divorce his wife and marry another. Do you know that? Her pastor was standing beside her. So in many places in the world, particularly in Latin and Africa, many hands would go up if you ask, are you a Christian? So one of the goals of the SALT program is, what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ in daily living? The other goal of the SALT program is to help people afflicted in chronic poverty better provide for their families in a sustainable way, reduce suffering, show the compassion of Christ. One of the most difficult things I wrestle with in the developing world is seeing unmet needs for children, seeing a child suffer for lack of basic food, shelter, health care, education. That just hurts. Why? 
Why or why? A few years ago, my family and I spent some time in a country in Southeast Asia. And about a week before we were fixing to leave, our young son was sled riding and broke his leg. He broke the tib and the fib right above his ankle. And um, the doctor set his leg and should we go? Should we stay at home? Should we delay? And the doctor said, nah, I think you can go. So we did. And I carried my son all through the community as I went to market and I had this little umbrella stroller. And I had many, many people come to me and ask me a question. They asked, they said, will he become well? And it took me a little while to understand what they were really asking. What they were really asking, will your son be a cripple for the rest of his life? That's what they were asking. Because in that country, just because there's health care doesn't mean it's accessible. You need money to be able to get treatment. You need money to be able to set a cast on a leg. How many people do you see beggars just deformed that basic health care would have helped? I know one day the Lord's going to return and make that right again, having children suffer. But in the meantime, can we provide some teaching so a man or a woman can better provide for their family? Now, a moment ago I said we focus on chronic poverty. Let's look at poverty a bit. Critical versus chronic. What's the difference? Now, before I talk about this, I'd like to say this. I believe that each one of us have some poverty in our lives. My life doesn't line up with this book. And there's not a one that does. Can I recognize the poverty in my own life? Is that possible? I know I have poverty in my life. So let's look at critical poverty. This is a picture from Nepal. There was an earthquake there a few years ago. Now, if I look at this picture for a bit, and I'd say I'd run up to this man, hey, I have just what you need. I have a teaching program. That would be silly, wouldn't it? He doesn't have food. He doesn't have water. He doesn't have shelter. He doesn't have health care. This man needs help. And there is a time to give relief and aid. There is a time. But many times when trying to help, we should pause and ask a question. If I don't do anything, what will happen? The answer is pretty obvious. If you don't do anything for this man, no food, no water, no shelter, disease, the man needs help and the Christian church should be known for compassion and giving. But like those Americans that went to Mexico, not all needs are the same and it requires real discernment and wisdom. Let's look at another picture. I've been in this community a few times. And when you walk into this community, the poverty is so severe, it just hurts deep within. I don't even know how to describe it. It just hurts. Now, the fact is, these people have lived in generational chronic poverty for a long, long time. And you ask the question, what do they need? Would a new house help? What if I don't do anything? Will anything change? No. They're going to go about their lives like they did yesterday and last month, last year, last decade, last century perhaps. But they have teaching material in their hands and many of them can't read it. This community was so poor they started saving with rice and eventually they, each meeting they would save about 15 cents one year, two years, three years. And when you first went there, please give us something. And then slowly, 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 there's a subtle change. And it's very, very careful. You miss it. They stopped asking for something. And they said they couldn't stop talking about what's happening in their hearts, in their communities, in their homes, in their 
business, whatever it might be. Only by the grace of God can anything help. So let's look at it a different way. Critical needs, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, effects of war, cyclones, elderly, disabled. The solution is relief. And it's a necessary component. On the other side is chronic poverty. Now, learned dependency is item one. And that's me. That's us. We did that to them. We harmed them. We did things that did not recognize their gifts and skills created by God. In the only, they're made in the image of God himself. Poor management skills. How many of us had an uncle, a father, that mentored toward us as we grew up and taught us trades and skills? Absence of good mentors, lack of startup capital, saving a sum of money for a future known expense, such as a farmer buying seed and fertilizer, is foreign to most people in developing countries. The solution is opportunity and teaching. And there's something that happens if we violate biblical principles in, in discerning need. We get a wrong view of ourselves, who, who we are, and we take the human dignity away from the people we're trying to walk with because they have a sound mind, they have strong muscles, they have water. What if when you're a newcomer, wow, they have this, wow, they have that, in verse, instead of, Really? They don't have this? They don't have that? Let's flip it on its head and look at what they do have. There's five different aspects of the SALT program. Microloans is no longer a focus today. It's only operating in a few countries. Savings groups is by far the workhorse, extremely effective. There's no financial money that's given to the community and the villagers or the beneficiaries. Working with farmers, Agri Plus. Uh, vocational schools, teaching trades in Uganda. There's a welding school um, in Ghana. There's an automotive school in Bangladesh. There's um, uh, sewing, tailoring classes and uh, computer classes, etc. So there's, again, young people teaching them life skills. Today, there's a little over 50,000 beneficiaries worldwide uh, operating in about 16 countries. And, you know, we keep track of the hours of teaching. The far right, you can see in, 20, in 2018, there were about 37,922 members, beneficiaries, if you will. And today, that's a little, I think this is dated a little bit. It's a little over 55,000 right now. So you can see a little breakdown. Vo vocational teaching is very small. It's a fairly costly endeavor. Agri Plus. 6,000 uh, farmers, uh, microloans is actually is only operating in Ghana and uh, Nicaragua today. Youth savings, tremendous opportunity with youth. Where does SALT operate? The numbers after the country name is how many different Anabaptist missions that are working there. Bangladesh, there's two different missions. Cambodia, um, there's another one that's looking to start in Cambodia. Ghana, Haiti, Honduras, India. These are alphabetized, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Niger, Nigeria, and Namibia, South Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, Ukraine, Zanzibar, and the stateside program reaching out in our own communities. Haiti is by far the largest. Bangladesh would be second. Ghana and Nigeria would be in similar size. Starting in a new country usually takes a few years, working with mission boards, field staff, orientation, in-country government approvals, coordination, translations of teaching material, record-keeping documents, etc. Okay, the last item I would like to look at as we conclude is to see if community development principles could complement church planting. Is that possible? Are there some things that we endeavor to do and learn in community development that could be a blessing as people come to the faith and or maybe look at the Bible in a new way and say, I like the South Sudanese woman. Did you know the Bible says that? I believe community development sets the groundwork for church planting, very active in the community, working with the natives. One of the things that community development or, or savings groups particularly does 
people are already familiar with assessing God-given gifts in daily living. And then it's a smaller step on following the Bible and how to build biblical church life. In other words, we always say in community development, let's, let's take at least a minimum of five-year view, ideally 10. It's going to be a long journey. And the changes are so incremental, and a lot of times they miss them. So we have a whole host of things built in to get people. Do you remember what she said a year ago? Look what she's doing today. You remember what he said? And just call those things out. But in many contexts in the world, they're not familiar with evaluating those things. So community development or savings groups particularly and weekly frequent teachings help them evaluate these things. And if they become a believer and they open Matthew chapter 5 and read on the Sermon on the Mount, what does that mean? Now they're well suited. They've had years of, of evaluating that. And what it tends to do, the missionary's focus changes from building church to calling indigenous believers to discover the Bible. I've seen that happen again and again. And after all, is there anything more that we as foreigners can do other than lift up the word of God? All of it, the whole word of God. There are organizations that explain away. God help us that we don't do that. That's what it says. How do you, uh, what, what does that mean? And ask them the questions. Now you might think that I believe there's nothing we can do as foreigners. No, I, I don't think that at all. I think there's a lot we can do. And here's a key I think that is very important and that is if we think about Anabaptist communities and churches stateside, one thing I believe we should share in humility is the process by which we take biblical principles and make group application to those principles, I believe we should share. Because that's one thing that the Anabaptist communities have done over long periods of time. Here's what it says. How should we apply that to our body, to our fellowship, to our believers, and then hold each other accountable to that? I believe that is a process by, that we can do. And salt savings groups, the inherent attributes of self-governance, creating bylaws, group discussions of important issues, submission to group voice and leadership can be a helpful pattern for disciplined church life. Now, perhaps we could create the perfect church planting course, all nations could, have the, the, the beautiful recipe, we do these things and we get that result, maybe. But one journey I've been on more recently is, I believe we should endeavor to do that. But absent the Lord's leading in moving souls, whether we have a slipshod plan or the best refined that we fasted and prayed on over for years, we need the Lord. Absent the Lord, it's of no value. So I don't think we should be careless or sloppy, but at the same time, recognize our limitations and our inability I'd like to conclude with a story from this past January and February. My, my wife and I and our two youngest children um, visited seven different Anabaptist missions in Southeast Asia. And as we visited each community, and walked with the missionaries there, they shared about what was happening. I would, I would get so inspired. I'd say, wow, that's amazing, seeing what God's doing here. And we'd move on and go to the next country. And then I'd hear it again. And after a while, about halfway through that trip, the Lord is working in every country, every community around the world in spite of us or because of us. How do you want to say it? I believe that for us to think 
that if we have the proper formula, everything's going to work well, and absent the proper formula, things aren't going to work well, God is moving in every nation. He uses, and I'm not, I know I'm preaching to the choir, he uses kingdoms of this world. He uses, you know, ungodly men to perfect his will. And may we be in tune close enough to the Holy Spirit and God to be able to know where we should step forward in faith. And I believe moving forward in faith and humility is essential while knowing our visions and plans many times may not be correct. But still, moving forward in faith is essential. May God bless you.